Let us commence the public worship of God, singing to his praise in the 21st Psalm, Psalm 21, singing verses 1 to 6, six stanzas. Verse 1, the King in thy great strength, O Lord, shall very joyful be. Thy salvation rejoice, how vehemently shall he. Thou hast bestowed upon him all that his heart would have. And thou from him didst not withhold whate'er his lips did crave. For thou with blessings him prevented of goodness manifold. And thou hast set upon his head a crown of purest gold. When he desired life of thee, thou life to him didst give even such a length of days that he for evermore should live. In that salvation wrought by thee, his glory is made great. Honour and comely majesty thou hast upon him set, because that thou forevermore most blessed hast him made, and thou hast with thy countenance made him exceeding glad. These verses, six stanzas of Psalm 21, the King in thy great strength, O Lord. The King in thy great strength, O Lord, shall very joyful be in thy salvation. Oh, yeah. 
see God in prayer, let us bow in his holy presence. <clears throat> o living and eternal, holy and righteous, sovereign and gracious God, who made us, who placed us here in this created world, each one of us in our own time, for our own allotted span, until that hour when we are called before thy holy presence for to give our account of ourselves unto God. While we are on our journey, we take this moment prepared by thee for us to appear in thy presence at this hour of worship, a worship that we cannot give worthily of ourselves. We have forfeited and defiled the place of worship by our sinfulness, our unbelief, our disobedience, our willfulness, our failures and shame. We cannot come, but there is one who can come, and he is willing by his own self and by his merits to open a way. There is a door open for us if we will come. It is hardly for those that have riches to enter the kingdom of heaven, but he, our God, our, our God dwells with him who is of a humble and lowly spirit. This is the way that we must take, the narrow way, the way by which we shed our own rights and claims and uh, ask for his rights and claims to be applied to us. Uh, oh, what justification there is in him. Oh, what a life of perfection, of obedience, of humble submission, of willing sacrifice, of full and perfect atonement eh, for the wicked, eh, for sinners. For while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Why did he die? It was the only method and means by which we could approach. And therefore we wish to dwell upon that mighty work that was done which cost him everything for he laid down his life as a ransom for many he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him with his stripes we are healed. Yes, this is the wonderful, willing way in which he made a way for us to enter in and by faith we can take him as our plea, uh, as our appeal and approach to thee. And therefore, Lord, help us each one, young and old, to with 
in agreement to enter in eh, and to enter into that holy place eh, where we can say truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We thank thee for all we've learnt of him, for all the eh, messages that have been delivered from this pulpit over the last year since eh, we met thus. He eh, bless thy servant as he continues that ministry in thy good providence. He eh, bless that ministry with great fruitfulness so that there will be an increasing number who are awakened who are drawn who are convicted humbled persuaded brought down to their own nothingness and lifted up by his fullness as the truth is proclaimed and as consciences are exercised as the spirit works as the word it pierces in the hearts and uh, as the grace of god is shed abroad oh grant it we pray in times of glorious blessing in this place and we beseech thee to remember those who are listening in that they will uh, feel a special <clears throat> interest taken in them by the gracious Saviour and they will say this is for me he has come to me where I am we beseech thee to remember eh, those who are careless among us around us here <clears throat> you heard the bell of the church but stayed where they were held immovable by their clinging to their sin and their unbelief Oh, even these can be reached, eh, for none is eh, beyond thy presence. For who can, who can escape from the all-seeing eye of the Creator? Eh, therefore be at work even this day in these consciences and hard hearts. And prosper also our homes and our eh, children, Bless the young among us and uh, bless the little ones that they may early uh, hear the voice of the shepherd and follow him. Uh, bless the Sabbath school teachers that they will have a uh, joy in declaring and offering Jesus uh, so that they may be one uh, for him. Those that seek him early shall find him. Remember Eh, the whole world in its groanings and sins and corruptions held eh, captive by eh, the evil one himself. Oh, we pray for that world, for we did God so love the world that he sent his Son. Oh, may we see eh, that glorious message penetrate even the habitations of horrid cruelty may it come into presidents' palaces, into prisons and dungeons, into places of affliction and terror, and may eh, the work be blessed. Remember the eh, Middle East Reform Fellowship as they are able to penetrate to Saudi Arabia and Iran, Afghanistan, eh, Egypt and eh, Morocco, prosper every effort that they make and uh, they build up even under the eye of uh, of the ayatollah uh, the blessed saving power of the son of god remember uh, the hudson taylor ministries prosper the new endeavors in bangladesh and may there be great a uh, great inroads made into the very fastnesses of uh, Satan, so that uh, the truth will set them free. Gather us now, Lord, in our minds and thoughts that we will be uh, held uh, by the leading and uh, of the rod and staff of the shepherd, so that we may be know him uh, who laid down his life for the sheep. 
We ask all in his name. Amen. Let's read the scriptures now in the Gospel of John, again, chapter 19. Chapter 19. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and said to them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crowd of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man! Then the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him. They cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him, and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went again into the judgment hall and said unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then said Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee? and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered, thee unto, delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover. And about the sixth hour, <clears throat> and he saith unto the Jews, Behold, your king, they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus, 
and led him away, and he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two other with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garment and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, let us not rend it, but let us cast lots for it, whose it shall be. That the scripture might be fulfilled, it saith. They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, he saith to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he saith to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon his up, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. Forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, 
Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, he sought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him leave, and he came that far and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which in the verse came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus, wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus therefore because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was nigh at hand. Let us re sing now from Psalm 38. Psalm 38, from verse 1 to verse 6, five stanzas. In thy great indignation, O Lord, rebuke me not, nor on me lay thy chastening hand in thy displeasure hot. For in me fast thine arrow stick, thy hand doth press me sore, and in my flesh there is no health nor soundness any more. This grief I have, because thy wrath is forth against me gone, and in my bones there is no rest sin that I have done. Do we want to verse 6? Eh, let us refer this to our Lord Jesus, taking our sins. Verses 30, Psalm 38, verses 1 to 6, five stanzas in thy great indignation. In thy great
I'll just read uh, these verses in our chapter we read, 19 of John 34, it says, But one of the soldiers with a spear to his side and forthwith there came out blood and water, and he that saw it bear record. <clears throat> And his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. <clears throat> Yesterday, friends, we talked about the cross in the experience of Andrew. <clears throat> Today, perhaps, we can meditate on the cross in the experience of John. The cross in the experience of John. We might even call it John's cross. What was the cross to John? <clears throat> When we looked at Andrew, we thought of him there in that upper room while his, while his master hung on that cross. And the deep reminiscences that he had way back there for these three years, especially when these 5,000 were fed and Jesus subsequent discussion revealing the sacrifice of God that he was. Today I'd rather we looked at John, the old man, looking back from years after uh, as he writes this gospel and leaves for uh, the beloved church in Ephesus, this record that we have here today. It's as if he's almost looking through a telescope and seeing a way back to these far gone days and his time with his savior. But you notice that when he begins this account, he sees even further back. As he looks back, he can see all the way back to the very beginning. And he says, in the beginning was the Word. It was the one I call the Word. He used the word, the Greek word, logos. A word which was full of meaning for the Greeks. It was part of their philosophy. This word, it meant a full, meaningful explanation. And when he said, in the beginning was the word, he was calling Jesus the explanation, the revelation. In the beginning was the revelation, and the revelation was with God, and the revelation was God. A revelation through words, so it's called the word. So look first, let this be our beginning on our way to the cross with John. Let our, begin, be, our beginning be there, which I, which, with which we can call the luminous Logos. The luminous Logos. You know, when something is luminous, you can see it in the dark. You know what I mean? If you're driving and something is luminous, a road sign, you can see it in the dark. This Logos is luminous. 
something. We can see God even in our darkness. <clears throat> what did Paul, what did John tell us? What is he telling us? He says, this is what I'm seeing. The Logos was with God. This man that I knew was there in the beginning. He was with God. And the expression he's using is towards God. In Greek, pros. The word was towards God. What it's conveying is two persons face to face. Can you see it? There in the beginning, before all creation, these two persons were always face to face. You know what it's like when you meet somebody face to face, perhaps you've never seen them. You've heard about that person. Perhaps somebody, your son comes home and he says, I found a girl that I love. You don't know her. He starts telling you about her and you're longing for the day when she arrives and you can see her face to face. You feel you know her. Well, this is what was happening in all eternity. They were face to face. There was nothing hidden. Between them, they were in perfect communication, harmony, confidence. The Father and the Son were in face to face fellowship. Now you see what it was like when he was there on the cross. He said, my God, why have you forsaken me? No, he hadn't forsaken him. But it seems that he turned away his face. Can you feel it? The one always face to face. I do always those things that please my father. But he's not pleased. He's turned away his face. What an experience for the one who was with God. But of course, he was not only with God. He was God. Here is John looking back at the wonderful man with whom he spent three years. Yes, three years only. But he said, he was God, and I was with God. I was face to face with him. The one who was with God, and who was God, was with us. He was with us, and he was God. The impossible happened. We, worthless, enemies of God, were with God. And we saw his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The luminous Logos. Was as Paul said, we saw the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And this continued. His experience of John, there was that time when a distinguished visitor arrived by night. And he was puzzled. 
He couldn't understand who this man was. And Jesus had to tell him, you have to be born of the Spirit. And at the end of that, and as his discourse went on, he said this. He said, truly, verily, I say to you, we speak what we do know and testify what we have seen. Jesus was not only with God, he not only was God, he was the witness of God. Throughout his ministry, throughout his life, but especially his ministry, he was a witness to these people, to these Jews, a witness of God, a direct communication to them from God. I ask you today, friends, have you received this witness? These Jews heard the witness, but they did not receive. Is there somebody here? You've heard the witness, but your heart is still closed. Or can I say of everybody here, your heart is open. Is that heart of yours open to Christ? Is it open to Christ? Or are you keeping it shut? He's witnessing to you today by your spirit, the luminous logos. And then there is this, friends. There is the The lowliness of this Logos, the lowliness, here is this glory of God clothed in lowliness, in humility. That's what we see in this passage before us in chapter 19. This glorious one is now treated with shame. And what does he do? Does he display his awesome power? No, he meets all of this with lowliness. Lowliness. The lowly logos. Look at this, friends. We'll just look at three things here. In verse 5 it says, Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man! What man? It's the same man. And John is there seeing this and recording it. This is John's cross. He sees the one that he loves. He says, that's my man. That is my Lord. But what is it? How does he appear? There is a crown of thorns on his head. He is cursed. The curse of Adam is on his head. And he's bearing it. Humbly. Willingly. Can you see this Christ of John? Why should he wear that crown? When he is worthy of the crown of glory. Ah, friends, because it's your crown, it's your curse. And you have to look at him, behold him. Behold him today, friends, the lowly Christ, taking what you did not need to take, taking the curse to deliver you from it. He was cursed 
he willingly, humbly took the curse. Not only was he cursed, but he was mocked. Hail King of the Jews! And they smote him with the, their hands. How can they do it? How can they do this? Our friends, that's what we have done. When we have preferred our own pleasure, preferred our own way, it's as if we've taken our hand to Christ. There are many doing it in the sky today. He's not striking them down dead. No, he's taking the smiting of the hands. Why? Because he said, I am meek and lowly of heart. The Logos, meek and lowly of heart. Is this your Christ? This is John's Christ. Not only is he cursed and mocked, he is exposed. Behold, take a look at him, everybody. Somebody in this terrible condition would want to hide away, keep it private. Pilate, don't let me go out there. This is a terrible situation. Bear to be exposed before his enemies. Lowliness. Can you see the heart of this man? This Jesus. And why should he? Why should he? Because your sins have to be exposed, friends. You keep them. You keep them secret. You can hide so much. Nobody knows these secret sins of yours, but they have to be exposed to be purged away. So Jesus humbly said, let me be exposed with the sins of my people. That's your savior. Behold. We read also in verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments, made four parts, and also his coat, without seam, they cast lots. John says, this is my saviour. Can you see him? Can you claim him? The lowliness of Jesus. He looks down from that cross and he sees his very clothes shared out. Can you imagine this happening to you? What did they do in taking away his clothes? They took away his dignity. That beautiful robe, it wasn't ostentatious. But it was special to him. It was his. It identified him. Everybody knew him and his appearance and recognized, ah, that's, that's the cloak. But where is the cloak now? It's in the hands of these hard-hearted, ruthless crucifiers. He has no dignity left, and he takes this humiliation. He has no covering. He's on that cross naked. As his clothes are stripped away, and they grab them for themselves. Isn't this what the world has been doing to Jesus? They have stripped him of his dignity. They've stripped him of his honor. And this is what we as sinners do. <clears throat> we take away from Jesus. If you're not honoring him today, friends, if you're not exalting him as king, if you're not obeying 
him and recognizing him as your Lord if you've not submitted all your life and all, every minute and every ounce of your strength to Christ, you're taking away from the Savior. That's your sin. And this, friends, he was loneliest because he could not, he could not protest. He could not appeal. As he hung there on that cross, they could do what they liked with what was his. Because a criminal had no rights. He was there accepting the place of a criminal, stripped of any right of appeal. Oh, what would you do if you felt God's judgment on you? Would you have an appeal? This is a day of appeal, friends. As long as you're in this world, you will have a course of appeal because he had no appeal. You could appeal on account of him. He suffered for me. He took my sin. Pardon me because he had no appeal he took him away he was taken from him my sin stripped him naked the lowliness of the logos it says also verse 34 just as we read one of the soldiers with a seer pierced his side and forthwith came out blood and water pierced. And John is there. Not like Andrew in the upper room. John is there with his eyes on the cross. And there is his master. And he has expired. Seems to be all over. But then this spear, spear is thrust into the body. No respect. Ah, even in his death, there was loneliness. What did that spear do? It abused his basic human right to be laid to rest, unharmed. Surely if he's paid the price, then he can, he should be left to be buried, but no. Even in death, his body is abused. Because that's what sin does. It abuses the Savior. Think of how we can abuse him. Not only was he abused, he was victimized. He was picked out. The other thieves didn't get this treatment. He was made a victim. He was picked out. Not because of anything he'd done or said, but in lowliness, it was ordained that he should suffer this victimize. He became the victim of your sin and mine. He was degraded. To treat a body like this was like, as if it was some dead dog or some animal ready to be butchered he was degraded he took upon himself our death even the death of the cross that's what the cross meant John saw it all he re took it in this is my saviour dying my death the lowliness. Friends, look at this contrast today. Like jo through John's eyes, see the luminous Logos, the lowly Logos. And now we come to the fencing of the table. And we will continue to use this precious passage 
that we may examine ourselves before we come to this table under the searching gaze of John as he beholds and records for us all the features that are so meaningful for him and he wants them to be meaningful for you. And here is something that, Paul, that John spells out. We can call it what he sees when he sees Jesus. He sees the living law. He sees the living law, the law alive. <clears throat> so often these Jews appeal to the law the Ten Commandments and all the laws of Moses and the say, there is our righteousness. We're doing it all to satisfy Jehovah. We are the sons of Moses. As Paul says in Philippians, according to the righteousness of the law, blameless. <clears throat> they specialized in the righteousness it was a dead righteousness and when John studied the life of his master and looked back he saw living righteousness <clears throat> he saw the living law it's as if the law was alive and walking among them the perfect the perfection of God in human form the living Contrast with that with how the Jews saw it. it. says here in verse 7, The Jews answered Pilate, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die. How come? Because he made himself the son of God. This was their verdict. According to their law, anyone who claimed to be God was a blasphemer, fit to die. Were they right? Yes, they were right. Anyone who claimed to be the Son of God deserved to die. Anyone who made himself the Son of God. And so according to the law, as they saw it, Jesus was a transgressor, a sinner, <clears throat> worthy, fit only to die and not to live. Did you see they made one mistake? Can you see it? He made himself. No, no, no. He didn't make himself the Son of God. He was the Son of God from all eternity. And of course he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Oh, their vain accusations collapsed when he rose from the dead. <clears throat> he was declared to be the Son of God with power, with all the authority of heaven, for indeed he was. <clears throat> And so he lived in fulfillment of the law. And you could look at everything he did, every word he spoke, yes, even th every thought he thought. It was an expression, a living expression of the holy, perfect law of God. By our law, he ought to live. And he did live. And if that's the case, friends, you are answerable, not to Moses, but to Christ. And if you come to this table, then you must accept his rule, his rule over you, his right to prescribe to you how you should live your life. And if you come forward, you're saying, I'm willing. That 
that's the law I want. That's the law that I respect. That's the law I want to fulfill, that Christ may live in me. And then this, friends, the living law in verse 19, Pilate wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Despite all the protests, he is lawfully declared by the authority of the time and no one could dispute the authority of Rome. They were the rightful rulers. God had allowed the Jews to come under subjection <clears throat> to Caesar. They admitted it themselves. And by this authority, Jesus was declared king. What that, where did that put the Jews? Because they were refusing to accept him as king, they were in rebellion. By declaring Jesus as king, he was declaring them rebels. And friends, Jesus is legally and rightfully king. No one has been able to <clears throat> dispute that truth that Jesus is king of the Jews. The Jews this day are still refusing, but he is their king, like it or not. And so friends, as we have already said, you must acknowledge him. If you don't accept him as your king, if you do not want to declare him as King of kings and Lord of lords, then you have no right to come to this table. We are among those who <clears throat> confidently declare there is no king but Jesus. We find the law fulfilled, the living law also, even in his death. Just at the moment before he died, we read that he took the, the vinegar and then made this great declaration, it is finished. What was this, friends? This was a legal declaration. He was pronouncing with the authority that he had won by his perfect sacrifice. He could declare on the authority of God that it is finished. What was finished? Well, it meant that <clears throat> every debt of his people had been paid. All the debt that we have piled up was no longer accounted against us. And we are legally declared in credit without any debt accounted against us. It is finished. Friends, when you come to this table, you're under this law. You're under this accountancy. <clears throat> and according to the accountancy of God, if you come here by faith, all guilt and shame that belongs to you is finished. You can come confidently without any thing to be held to your account for he has taken it. And so we can read our traditional passage in Galatians to show this distinction as we find it in Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> there we read the contrast. Verse 16 says, This I say then, walk in the spirit, do not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh Lust is against the spirit, is against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that 
you would. If you be led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. These are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now let us pray, let us pray. Gracious God, as we here declared the great Logos, the great revelation in the person of Jesus, we see him through the eyes of John. And we can say as John recorded, my Lord and my God. Give us that confidence, persuasion, and faith to come and declare him before all men that the one who was humbled and abused and broken on the cross is the one who is both Lord and Christ for me. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we shall now sing, as is customary in Psalm 118. And while we are singing, the elders shall bring in the elements, set the table of the communion. Psalm 118, at verse 15. In dwellings of the righteous is heard the melody of joy and health. The Lord's right hand doth ever valiantly, the right hand of the mighty Lord. Exalted is on high the right hand of the mighty Lord. Doth ever valiantly, I shall not die but live, and shall the works of God discover. The Lord hath me chastised sore, but not to death, given over. And just so far, we shall sing Psalm 118, verse 15. I shall, in dwellings of the righteous. <clears throat>
And now as we continue to sing, we ask those who want to profess his name publicly to come forward quickly eh, to the table as we continue to sing, come forward. <clears throat> table. I want to say a few words of encouragement to you continuing on the theme of the lowly logos. I want to speak about the alluring love John is the apostle of love. As we look over these experiences of John and his cross, and those who he pick, picks out and points to, we see the alluring love. We read in the Old Testament of Christ alluring his bride into the wilderness. Do you know something, friends? Do you know something of the alluring love? That drawing love of the Son of God. Look at John, for instance, there as he is grieving over the suffering Savior, he hears his voice. He hears his voice say to him, <clears throat> first to his Mary who is standing there, also 
with him. And he addresses her, even in the midst of his pains and agonies, he looks down and he saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved. He saith to his mother, woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple, as John writes this down, he says, from that disciple, I took her into my own home. He took her into his own home. You see, the love of Christ brings us together at this table. When we are drawn by his love, he draws us together. <clears throat> there, is a, there is a bonding taking place here between John and this woman, the mother of Jesus. In fact, we could say that Jesus, from above, looking down on these two, was instituting them as a church, because the church is tied together by love. It's not a love that we generate, it's a love that flows down to us from our Saviour. And so we're joined not by any human means, but we're joined by heavenly means. Do you remember that verse again in the first chapter of John? <clears throat> when he speaks about those who receive him, he says that to as many as receive him, to them gives he the power to become the children of God, even to those who believe. They're joined to him by faith, who believe in his name. Not by the will of the flesh, not by the will of man, but of God. So it's not a natural love that joins us together as his people. It is a heavenly love. It's the agape love that joins us, that as we look up to heaven, up to him, he draws us together, the alluring love. And this also applies to others. For John, even after Jesus dies, speaks of a, another remarkable evidence of this heavenly love. Look, for instance, at Nicodemus. Nicodemus was drawn to the grave and drawn to Joseph. This noted leader of the Jews forsook the company of his august but treacherous and envious colleagues <clears throat> and love drew him to that place of Golgotha and to that graveside <clears throat> where they and he brought with him a hundredweight of spices. Can you imagine him? Probably with a little donkey eh, alongside him carrying this load. It's as if he just emptied his store. Why? Why did you do it? 
It was the alluring love that drew him to his death. You see, when he'd come to Jesus, when he was first drawn to Jesus there in John chapter 3, as he was drawn powerfully, he couldn't, he had to overcome his sense of danger and embarrassment and uh, fear. And, um, and yet he came, he couldn't stay away. But, so he came by night. And this is what Jesus said to him before they parted. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Nicodemus saw what John saw. He saw this Jesus, this prophet, this man of God, this messenger of God, this son of man. He saw him lifted up. And then taken down and he hurried along with his gift his parting gift as he thought to the one in whom he trusted he was drawn by the lifted up savior <clears throat> or his friend there they could be perhaps you are a joseph of arimathea perhaps you are a joseph of Arimathea tonight, today. What about him? Oh, he didn't confess Christ because of the fear of the Jews, because of the fear of his acquaintances and of the crowd and of the people, the public. No, he couldn't bear to confess to his shame. He couldn't. But at the last, what happened? When so many opportunities had been lost, he came. It seemed as if it might be too late, but he's here recorded. His love is recorded in scripture forever after. No, it wasn't. It wasn't too late in this sense. He could still pay his tribute in acknowledging his faith in Christ. Are you one, friends, who is coming late? Why didn't you come before this? Oh, the Savior has not ceased to allure you, and that's why you're here today. I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. And now we shall read the warrant that we have to be here as we find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it 
in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you to show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And so after the example given by our Lord, we will give thanks. O oh, gracious God, our hearts are full as we meditate and receive the blessed account again of our Saviour's beginning, or should I say eternal eternity, in the beginning, and his coming down, down, down to some eyes such abuse that our sins have put on him but in love he says come and remember what I did for thee come and remember what I did for you all when I poured out my blood and my body was broken for you and uh, confess me Confess me before the world and remember that we shall meet on that day to come. Therefore, our hearts flow over with thanksgiving to such a Saviour and Lord. And we bless thee, O Father, for the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So on the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and break it, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat, in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show, to show the Lord's death until he come. Drink ye all of it.
Well, friends, we were reading in the prayer meeting this morning in the Song of Solomon in chapter 2. And we read there in verse 3 these words, I sat down under his shadow with great delight. I sat down under his shadow with great delight. What were you doing today? Well, you were sitting down. You are sitting down. And where are you sitting down? Well, the verse tells us, under his shadow. Under Christ's shadow. Now, there are all sorts of shadows in this world. There are bad shadows and ominous shadows. And there are good shadows. And Christ's shadow is the best shadow. He's described in Isaiah 32 as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land, bringing shelter and help. And you know, if you're under his shadow, it means he's near. You can't be under a shadow that's far, far away. The appearance of the shadow, if you're standing and a shadow appears, you know that somebody is near and he is near to his church according to promise i sat down under his shadow now what does that mean in practice <clears throat> well it means first of all that you're under the shadow of calvary to borrow hugh martin's phrase and calvary casts a long shadow shadow runs down through the ages of history and it shades the Christian it shades the Christian it's a it's a relieving shadow it shades the believer from the burning fierceness of the law and divine justice the soul that sins it shall die the Bible tells us but then we were reminded, was it on Thursday or Friday evening, by Mr. Smith when he spoke about the Chinese Christian trying to explain his faith with a few, very few English words he had. But he, he didn't need any more words. He captured it well. He captured it perfectly. He died. Me no die. You are under the shadow of Calvary. Christ's death on Calvary is the shadow from the curse of the law, from the penalty of the broken law, a soothing, a soothing shadow rather for the conscience. So you're under the shadow of Calvary, but you're also sitting under the shadow of the promises. The shadow of the promises. In all the difficulties you face, in all the distress you face, you're sitting at the table under the shadow of the promises. And you're sitting at the table too under the shadow of heaven. Heaven that he purchased for you. And what is heaven but Christ? My, my friend, if you got to heaven and Christ wasn't there, it wouldn't be heaven. You would want to leave very quickly. No amount of other things would make up for his absence. I sat down under his shadow. But you're saying to me, soon I'll get up. I won't be sitting down anymore. I'll no longer be under his shadow. Oh, yes, you will. He has promised to overshadow you. His feathers shall thee hide. Thy trust under his wings shall be. What's that but overshadowing? What's that but being under a shadow? I sat down under his shadow with great delight. Christian, Christ is your delight, isn't he? It's not the church. It's not organized religion. It's not even this building, dear as it is. It's not even those who are there with you. Dear as they are. But Christ and Christ alone. 
If his shadow isn't there, it doesn't really matter what other shadows there are. And in a very real sense, if his shadow is there, the absence of other shadows, difficult as that may be, is more than compensated. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. I don't have time to go into that just now. Maybe we'll come back to it again soon. But it is sweet. It is sweet. One last word, I, I sat down under his shadow. Others sat down once, you couldn't say I then. You've come to Christ and you've found Christ and Christ has found you. You can say, and that's what you're saying, I sat down, even me. And that's the greatest astonishment of all. I sat down under his shadow with great delight and his fruit was sweet to my taste. We'll rise from the table singing in Psalm 103, 103 and we're going to sing these first four verses there. O thou my soul, bless God the Lord. O thou my soul, God, our Lord and Saviour, who loves us with an everlasting love, we want to love thee too. We want that love of ours to grow, and we want to have that love which thou hast for a perishing world around us. Oh, may we go from this place with a heart kindled in you, with that great love, 
of Christ, who laid down his life for his friends. And may we, may that shadow that we felt today eh, shadow us all the way. May we not wander from that gracious company until all shadows flee away and we come into the full and glorious light, eh, unshadowed and undimmed in that glory to come when we shall see his face and be face to face with the great and glorious Son, and grant that those who have been watching what was done today may have said, we want to be there, we want to be one with God's people, we want to be one with eh, the Son of God whom John saw and left eh, us in his legacy, that view of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Oh, turn every face toward Jesus today. Oh, may we no longer turn away our faces or hide from his gaze, but may we say, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. So hear us and accept us, and all our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. We conclude by singing in Psalm 72, closing verses from verse 17, his name forever shall endure, last like the sun it shall, men shall be blessed in him, and blessed all nations shall him call. 17 to the end, Psalm 72, his name forever shall endure. His name forever Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit remain with you now and forever. Amen. I'll, uh, I'll make more intimations this evening. I don't want to take time up with it just now. Just to remind you that the evening service is at half past six, that little bit later today. <laughs>